Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Keys Method. This is 14 Keys of Thinking Like a Pro. I'm your host, Chris Keys, and I'm joined today with a very special guest in Orb Studios right here in Austin, Texas. I am with Matt Noveski. Thank you for joining the Keys Method, Matt Noveski. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. It's always man, good to see you. So, so I'm super excited, man, just for you guys that... Don't know, I know most of you guys, y'all have probably seen him. If not, you've heard of his music. He's a bass player. He's a producer, a platinum uh, producer. He's worked with Christina Aguilera. You've worked with Blue October, uh, Unlikely Candidates, uh, Dirty Honey, DMC. I'm reading a list here. I mean, Joshua Radin, Alpha Reeve. Uh, I mean, you just keep going down the list. I mean, yeah. you, you've got a long of experience in the music industry yeah let's dive into this so where i know you come from a big musical background mm -hmm. family uh and everything but when did music kind of start for you where did you pick up music at what age man that's a good question so so i guess it's one of those things that i don't i don't really remember when it became like the most important thing i mean it was always a very important thing to me um you know thinking back to when i was a kid and you know, my, my cousins having like, and my, my uncles being bass players, having real instruments and drums and, you know, it was always around and my older brother's a drummer. So it was always around me. But when I was, you know, as a little kid, I was, I was always kind of that, you know, um, the spectator, you know, I was always okay. like, man, I wish I could do that, man. I want to do that. You know, man, I wish I could play guitar. And then, um, when I was, uh, 11, I got my first, uh, my first bass. And okay. I actually I borrowed it from a friend, right? My friend had a bass; he never played it. Shout out to the friend. Yeah, right. Um, Adam Dixon, actually, who I haven't I haven't talked to in a long time, but he he had a he had a he had a bass guitar for whatever reason, and, and he didn't play it. And so I was like, "Well, I want to learn." He's like, "Take it." So I borrowed it, hmm. and uh, I don't think I ever gave it back to him. <laughs> but um, but it was one of those things where it's you know I. Uh, I have two uncles that both played bass and are both phenomenal bass players. They're both very, very, very established, very, mm -hmm. you know, really good at what they do. And um, and so I grew up going to see them play and witnessing them play shows when I was a kid. Uh, you know, so bass to me was already an attractive instrument because I I loved the way that my, my Uncle Jim played bass. And I loved the fact that it was kind of like drums and guitar all wrapped into one. Yeah. You know, yeah. because my, my again, my brother being a drummer... And it being the sort of the backbone of the of the of the music of the song, but then being get to play melody, you know. So bass mm -hmm. to me is like it's it's rhythm, it's harmony, and it's melody all wrapped in one. Mm -hmm. And so I I taught myself, and I would just sit there and listen to cassette tapes in my room, and I would just play along, and I didn't even have an amp. You for just the like just try to figure know? out. Oh, this note kind of sounds close. Yeah, yeah or, I think that's yeah. it, right? And and funny enough, actually, one of the like just I had this memory the other day. One of the one of the first songs that I really dove into was uh, "Groove Is in the Heart" by D Light, and it's a Bootsy bass line. Yeah, nice. And um, and I remember sitting there learning that song, playing along with it, but I didn't. I for me, nobody told me when I was a kid, "Hey, start with the easy stuff." <laughs> nobody told me that you should start with "Smoke on the Water" and you should, you know, and like "Kiss" or whatever, you know. Some so little one, four, five, some easy, simple, some simple stuff, man. And, yeah. And so I was like, oh, I like chili peppers. I like Primus. I like Fishbone. So I started playing. So I was s sitting there learning songs that looking back now, I'm like, those songs are kind of difficult. You know, like Rush is not easy to play when you're 12 or 13 years old. So I was teaching myself that music. And then my brother and my brother's best friend, I pulled out the bass and, I, and his bass player in his band was mm -hmm. also, it was, he, he, he was over at our house. And I said, hey, check this out. I can slap. And I showed him this thing and he just went and he was like, Dave, come here for a second. And my brother came over and he's like, did you know he could play? And my brother was like, no, <laughs> like wow. what's going on here? And that was, I, I still, to this day, I remember that moment. And that's when I was mm. like, okay, I think I'm onto something. That was a big confidence boost. It was. Day. Yeah. Big Getting time. From your... Big time for sure. So you didn't, you didn't go to school. Were you in the band at all? Uh, playing a little Man, bit? Man, I, I played in bands, uh, Oh my gosh! I've probably been in a thousand bands. Honestly, I I 
when I was in high school, all I cared about were my bands and playing like Battle of the Bands and, you know, preparing for Battle of the Bands and making flyers for Battle of the Bands. And, you know, and I was in a bunch of really horrible bands in the beginning, you know, but you kind of have to like, you got to suck for a long time before you get good. And you got to play with crappy musicians to, to, <laughs> to learn, you know, what works and what doesn't. That's and, true. And so, so some good friends and I, we all kind of came up together and there was sort of a group of us that we're in different bands at different times and we all kind of had this sort of like ancestral thing where there were a bunch of bands but some of us were in bands together and then in other bands and but we all grew up together and some of those funny enough some of those guys are to this day are still very good friends of mine and they're very they're in successful situations all over the all over the country all over the world and yeah. they're playing with different bands and different artists and producing and all kinds of stuff and you know, but but I just I just stuck with it, and I just cared so much about playing that it really took over school for me. I went to college to appease my parents, right? And yeah. I went to college for elementary ed. I I didn't want to be. I think that was the same here. Teacher. If I didn't play basketball, I don't I don't know yeah. if I would have made it through college all the way. Right there, you go, just, man. That just wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. my passion for sure. Music yeah. was my passion. I. What college did, yeah. did you go to? Uh, which one didn't I go to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I went to, uh, I grew up in Michigan, and so right. um, I went to Western Michigan University, and then uh, it didn't last very long. Music, again, took over, um, and I was gigging a lot, and that kind of got in the way, you know, mm -hmm. but then I, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I moved back to my hometown in Traverse City, and uh, I went to community college, and then I moved to Ann Arbor, and I was going to go back to school, and that's actually when I joined Blue October. That's when I actually met our booking agent. Okay. And by that time, so, my bands didn't suck anymore. You know? Yeah. So that was that was uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Before we get to Blue October, though, mm -hmm. let's let's just go back a little bit. So, how was your mindset? Like, okay, you got the confident booster. Okay, maybe I can do this. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you've been into you was passionate about music, but mm -hmm. did, what was your goal then? Where you like, okay, I'm trying to. Let's go get these hit records. Let's go on tour. Or were you yeah. like, you know, whatever comes, I'll just, I'm just excited to be playing. What you know, I don't think I've actually ever been asked that before. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Um, and it's putting me back in that mind frame. And when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, which is music at that point was just it was coming from a pure place. Right. And I wrote songs, and it didn't matter if there was a formula. It didn't I didn't even know what a chorus was for the longest time. I just wrote stuff because it felt good. Yeah. You that's know? probably the best music you made. That was so time, awesome, right? man. It was, you know, and it was fun. And that's yeah. the most important thing is that I had a, I was, I was passionate about it and I cared about it and I had a great time doing it, but, but it was fun. And then, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wow, girls are starting to like me, <laughs> you know, like, think, whoa, what's going on here? There's it's kind the of this, thing, this girls. byproduct is happening, you know, but, um, you know, I don't know. It just kind of became my identity, I guess. After a while, I was like, I was the musician, I was the bass player, you yeah. know, and, and that became uh, just a part of who I was, and it was kind of my DNA, and I was I was fine with that. I liked that, you know, and I didn't mind. I really, I really, I really kind of enjoyed being that guy and being sort of known as that guy. And mm -hmm. um, but but I didn't. But as far as goals go, and as far as like long term goals, it wasn't until I was in college and I started to realize I didn't want to be in college mm. that it became okay. What am I going to do here? Yeah. You know, am I going to give this a real shot? Am I gonna try to make this a career, or am I just gonna, am I gonna bartend forever? You know, right. like what am I gonna do? And so, I I had a band and and we did some really cool stuff, man. And and I'm still to this day very proud of that band. And we started getting making a name for ourselves in Michigan, and we started gigging around, you know, down into Ohio and Illinois and. Chicago, all that kind of stuff. But but in Michigan, we started becoming like kind of one of the it bands in the area. Mm -hmm. And we started playing in Lansing and Detroit and, uh, you know, Kalamazoo, Mount Pleasant. Like we started really building a following there. And that's when I started to really take it seriously because I saw that, you know, crowds started showing up yeah. and people started listening to our music. The mistake that I made, though, was I didn't take serious the recording side of it. Mm. Because to me, that was, well, that costs money. I'm right. not going to spend money on a record when I can go play live and you know, and, and, and have fun, you know, and, and, but what winds up happening in that situation is you, just, you spin your wheels a lot because you're playing shows mm -hmm. and you're playing show after show and then people are getting into it. And then, it, yeah, it's kind of this organic thing and it's very grassroots. But what happens is you go back and play that city again and two people, 
two more people show up instead mm. of 30 or 40 or 50 people, which is what should have happened. Mm. And that should have happened because we should have had a real record or a real CD at that time, a real product. But right. but we, we just didn't take it seriously enough to do to go into that. You know, so we were so focused on the live aspect of it. But I was also the guy in the band that was mailing flyers and was in EP in, in well and not electronic press kits, but press kits. The actual press like kits. Like actual in the press mail. kits, you wow. know, with cassettes and band photos and I was that guy that's like, We're off. Everybody's gonna go to the beach or do whatever. Hey, I'm gonna make press kits. Yeah. And I'm gonna mail them out and try to get these guys to let us open. You know, you've always put in the legwork, then. Yeah, I grinded, Kinda. man. Yeah. I was I was grinding when I was seventeen, eighteen. So what do you what do you want to say to like a kid saying, "Hey, man, like I got music. You know, our band, we kind of do some things." But how do how do you tell them though? Okay, you guys want to take the leap of faith. Yeah. What 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 would be some encouraging things to to kind of get them going? Because it's it's a little scary feeling to kind of do what. Sure what you did to get out there and sometimes those flyers you don't get the response that you're you're expecting yeah. once you put out those flyers so did it ever come a point man this isn't working man my bands they're not kind of buying into oh, the yeah. grind like i'm doing oh yeah that for frustrated sure. yeah. like how do you battle through all that and somebody that's in that situation kind of help them well i i think that i'm in a unique situation now and i have a unique perspective on this because i work as a mentor and as a producer with a lot of younger artists, I work with a lot of, you know, um, I'm, I'm the old guy now. I don't know how that happened, but I'm the old guy now, you know, and I work with these younger kids and I work with these younger bands. And a lot of times I, I can see the first day who's serious and who's not. Right. And I can see who's putting everything they got into this and who's just along for the ride. And and to me, you know, it's it's it really is about like, look, you're going to make mistakes. Sure. You're going to write a uh, hundred horrible songs to get one good song. Mm -hmm. And that one good song is worth writing those hundred songs for because that can change things for you. The power of a great song is, is, is you know, I mean, it's, it's it, I can't state how important that is enough, you know, that a great song really can change the world. It really can. Mm -hmm. But you have to grind and you have to work and work and work. And just when you think that you've done something great and somebody breaks your heart by telling you how awful it is, you can't let that get to you. You can't let that get you down. You can't start doubting yourself. You can't start succumbing to pressures. You can't do those things. You got to stay strong. You got to have conviction. And I think at the end of the day, you can't be afraid to take risks. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, when, when I met the band, I, I was in between jobs, I was in between girlfriends, I was, you know, I, I was basically kind of just floundering. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, and my band was kind of up in the air at the time. And I said, screw it, I love this band, I'm packing my car and I'm moving 1,600 miles away. Well, and and if I had some friends that were like, you're crazy, yeah. like that's stupid, why are you doing that? But I had to take that risk, I had to try. Mm -hmm. You know, and so to me, I think that if you, if if something, if something that you're passionate about, if there's a real opportunity there, but the risk is, is massive, sometimes you have to just say, screw it, I'm going to give it a shot and see what I can do. And that might mean that you drop out of school for a while, or that might mean that you piss off your parents or whatever that is. But if you're serious about your craft, you've got to work really hard at it and you and you have to put the time in you got to grind you got to work your butt off it's not going to happen overnight a yeah. lot of shows make people think that they can become a star overnight it's mm -hmm. not that easy right you know it's tough yeah for sure for sure man and uh thank you for take, taking that leap, leap of faith man yeah, because thanks. i mean you're you're influenced just by your actions so let's talk about that i mean you by this point in time you've wrote hundreds of songs thousands mm -hmm. of songs and you uh with Blue October, mm -hmm. uh, that was, was was that one of your early bands that you start playing with, or did so? Because uh, um, you've been with them for a long time, a man. long time, twenty twenty one years. Just getting started, yeah, man. We're, we're just, just getting, getting started. started. Yeah. We made something like a yeah. thousand records. Um, I joined Blue October when I was twenty two or twenty three years old. Oh wow! Um, and so I had had several bands, you know, through mm -hmm. high school and then after high school my my better bands you know sure. um but i i was in uh i was actually in a band that was very hip hop influenced i was in a horn band that was very much about the horns and right. um you know so i tried a lot of different things i did a lot of different things 
And in Blue October at the time was a stretch for me because stylistically it wasn't what I was necessarily playing. Mm. And it wasn't in Michigan what I was doing. It was very different from what I was doing. Um, Did y'all connect when you was in Michigan? So I actually flew down and caught a show in Austin. Um, Really? Yeah, so I met them through the old booking agent slash manager for the band. My band had opened for a band that he was working with. Hmm. And so I met him. He came and saw my band. And this is actually one of those moments that you're talking about, right, where you get back up after you get your heart broken. He came and saw my band, and he was like, your band sucks, (laughs) straight up. Your band's awful. But you're a hell of a bass player, Hmm. and your drummer's a hell of a drummer. Hmm. Call me if you guys want to, you know, if you need some help. Right. <laughs> you know, and so put it um, nicely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, and you know what? He was right. It wasn't that the, the musicianship wasn't there because a- honestly, everybody in the band was phenomenal and great writers too. Mm-hmm. We were just kids. Yeah. We didn't know. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a craft. Like let's write great songs. It was hey, let's just write what we're feeling. You know, we didn't we we didn't see the big picture. We didn't take it seriously enough to really you know, put the legwork in before we tried to get all of the mm. benefits and, you know, right. and reap all the benefits of it. So so he was right. We just weren't ready as a band. And he was working with Blue October. And again, I, I was sort of in between things. And I ran into him and and he said, you know, uh, just keep in touch with me. And then he reached out to me and he said, I got a band I'm working with and things aren't working out with the bass player. You want to go check them out? And at the time I was like, man, I've never been to Texas. Austin sounds like a cool place. Mm. I flew down. And I saw the band, and when I saw the band and I saw the singer perform, I knew right then I had to do it. Hmm. Because I, it's the same thing. I don't know how, how common this is anymore, but back in the day, you used to go to like Lollapalooza or whatever it was, right. or Warp Tour or whatever, and you'd, you'd discover new music live, not necessarily on the radio or Spotify. Yeah. Or, but you'd go see a band, and I saw Rage Against the Machine in 1993 play at 11 o'clock in the morning on the main stage at Lollapalooza and never heard of him before. Jeez. And it changed my world. Yeah. You know? And I got that same feeling watching this band play in front of 200 people. Now, it's not Rage Against the Machine, it's a much different vibe. Right. But the singer had that it factor, had that thing where he was just commanding the you audience. Knew. And I was like, that guy's a star. Right. He's a star. Was you know? he a star at the time? Oh, he was. He Absolutely, was. He man. Was that guy's always been. <laughs> he's always been special. You know, he really has. And and uh, and uh, and and it was still early on. So not that the songs weren't really good. The songs were good, but his live show was where it was really at. Mm-hmm. And the band, you know, there's violin and just just to, it had a had a unique thing going on. And and even though it was stylistically different than what I was used to, I felt like, okay, I get it. I feel like I could bring something to the table. Maybe right. some of my my Motown influence I could bring to the table, mm-hmm. you know, and um, in some groove, you know, I yeah. could kind of bring that to the table. And, and it worked out, man. And and twenty some years later, here we are. Man, you know? music is a universal language, you know. Oh, you yeah. guys, yeah, musically, y'all 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 say some some real good stuff yeah. up there on stage musically. We we've had people say call it like reality music. Yeah. You know, it's like reality TV, like we're reality music. We don't yeah. pull any punches. There's no there's no BS. It's all it's all real. So let's know? get into writing I mean, writing some of the songs with Blue October for a minute. So you guys uh, did y'all go platinum on one of your albums? We or? did, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a thing <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> that was a thing back yeah. in the day to actually go platinum. Was, so yeah. the real way. All yeah. right. So yeah. so I mean, what was that experience like just the whole process of recording that album? Sure. Which album was that? Uh, so that was actually foiled. Uh, that came out. We recorded it in two thousand five, and it was released in two thousand six. Okay. Um, so it came out kind of at the end of like the golden era of music when people when you still sold a lot of albums and a lot of records and streaming really wasn't a big deal then. Sure. Yeah. You know. So um, and not that everybody sold a lot of records because platinum was a big deal. It was yeah. a huge deal. Going gold was a huge deal. Right. Um, but it was really surreal for us because by that point, let's see, I joined in '98. And I had left for a while and came back, mm-hmm. and um, that was our third. That was my third album with with the band. Okay. And so by that point, you just kind of get used to like, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. You know, we've got we we draw really well in Texas. We played with some some other bands that are doing okay, but we haven't really broke. We're not like a a, a household name by any means. We're not a huge band at all. Um, and then all of a sudden we go out and we make this record and, um, 
and, and you know, and we're with a label at the time. We're with a, ma- a major label, so okay. at the time, it's like let's just use as much of the label's money as we can before this is over. <laughs> you know, it's like let's, let's make some let's really bad decisions. It, yeah. You know, let's just run this credit all the yeah, way. Yeah, let's just you know, because because I mean that's the thing. It's like recoup. We're not gonna recoup. Let's just spend it all. So we so we really like we went all out though, and we made a brilliant record, mm-hmm. and we made a great record, and um, a record that I'm still very proud of. And we had this one song that the president of the record label was like, that's it. That's the one. And at the time, it was like seven minutes long or something. So we were all like, you're crazy, man. That's not. So we edited it down, released the song, and we're out doing radio promo at the beginning of the album cycle, which we were used to doing, where you basically go to radio stations and you go meet whoever feels like showing up. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's two people, sometimes there's 30. But you go play acoustic for them in the lounge, you know, and sure. we do that in all these different cities. And we're out there doing that. And we're traveling, and our manager's with us. And, and every day he's like, guys, the song, it went to number two. And we're like, okay, I don't know, what does that mean? You know, like, cool. <laughs> and he kept telling us, he's like, guys, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. Like, this is, re- this is like popping. This is going off. And we were like, what do you mean? Like, we're with you in a bus. I don't see anything cool happening, right. you know? And then and the next thing we know, we come back to Austin, and we're at the Driscoll Hotel, doing a South by Southwest event, and he comes in the room and he's like, guys, you're going to be playing Jay Leno. That's when it all went, okay. That thing, that song grew legs. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. this is real. Like, this is actually happening. You know, like, people right. are actually responding to this. And and the song basically was a smash. I mean, it was like, it was a big deal. It was a big song, and it opened a lot of doors for us. Um and it, it, you know, it was. It wound up really launching our career, and it's the reason I feel like we still have a career to this day because mm-hmm. that, you know, it, it put so many eyeballs on us that it really it, it did what a lot of bands always kind of dream of and what they hope for. But we also, not long after that, went through a really awful period too as a band, whereas we went through some very personal things, and and we came out the other side of that, and now we're in this like we are we're one of those few bands that's still together. Yeah. Still loves each other. Right. We're family. You right. know, we're not just, you know, um, colleagues. Right. You know, we, we are just, family. Just the gig. Just, yeah. Let's I do mean, this and go home. Ju- Justin's daughter is at my house right now with my daughter. Right. She's been there for three days. Yeah. My daughter was there last week for three days. You know, it's like, we're tight. Right. We care about each other, you know. and that's, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. It really is. And it's this crazy... It's this crazy thing that rarely ever happens, and I, I, I work with, again, I have this perspective that's a little mm-hmm. different than everybody else because I work with so many other artists, and I just don't see that a lot. I, I see a lot of division. Right. I see a lot of uh, singer-songwriters that are scared to even just try to do things with the band because they're like, it's my vision. I don't really want to go there. you know. But I'm just really blessed, man. I'm really blessed to have found that band. But then again, if I hadn't just said... You know, F it, I'm packing my car and I'm moving to Texas. It never would have happened. I don't that even know risk. where I'd be right now. Wow. Yeah. So it worked out for you. I it mean, it out. was a calculated risk, but I mean, it, it was yeah. well kind of worked out for, for you. Sure. Yeah, and, for and sure. And so y'all have been together for 20 years, you said? So I've been and with the band since 90, end of 98, early 99, and they've the band started in 96. And from that time, from that time, you have your, your hit record to, mm-hmm. uh, I think, what is it? 10 top 20 uh, 10, 10 top then. 20 songs yep alternative modern rock songs yeah so how's the writing process now i mean you have some success you kind of figured out the secret mm-hmm. i mean the what works for you guys so when you when you approach a new record now is it uh kind of uh, you know whatever yeah. or are you kind of like you know what we still got a message and we're Dude, we're still i love that question um we are I feel like it's more of a challenge every record. And I feel like it's more fun every record too because we've never been complacent. We never ever let ourselves just fall into traps or habits. In fact, if there's one thing that's probably really hard about being in this band, it's that just when we think we got it figured out, somebody throws a curveball into everything. And then it's the next record and it's, no, 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 no. We already did that. Now we're going to make this album. And it's like, are you kidding me, man? <laughs> I no, just figured that out, you know. Like, um, so we we don't settle, and every record is different. And I got I got to say the other thing that that's really that's really amazing about this band, and I and I love is that we we aren't 
the old guys that only listen to our peers. Mm. We a lot like almost all of us, probably all of us in the band. Yeah, we love the stuff we grew up on, but we listen to modern relevant music today as well. So when we go in to do stuff, a lot of times we're referencing our like brand new artists or artists that are, you know, their first album and and yeah. so we are constantly keeping ourselves in check. Like let's not become irrelevant. Let's not make music that, you know, only people in their forties and fifties can relate to, you know. So mm-hmm. our crowd has grown because of it and our, our fan base has grown because of it. It's more diverse because of it. I was gonna say your fan base looks like it's constantly just all over the place. Massive. I mean, yeah. everywhere you go, I mean Yeah. Everybody knows Blue October, I mean. In in our demographic is everybody. Yeah, you know, true. It's it's not you know just twenty year olds or thirty year olds. It's everyone. I mean, there's kids, there's pe- there's grandparents, and everybody in between at our shows. Yeah, that's that's the music. And though, man, I, I'll tell you, man, it, I feel like after watching one of your shows live is, man, it, it's just like a a, a blessing almost. You, oh, you just feel you. different. You know, it's a feeling. You really you. walk in one way feeling, you know, one way, but you walk yeah. out like. It's That's cool. Something is different. Yeah. Like I don't know what it is, and it kind of takes a week before you figure out. But like, man, That's the awesome. music that y'all wrote is is, yeah. is really special. Thank you, yeah, man. Thank sure. you. Yeah, we. Uh, that means a lot, and that's really important to us. Like we don't we don't want to just go out and go through the motions and put on a show and then it's yeah I saw it last year. Like we 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 want there to be a message and we want there to be a feeling of togetherness and a feeling of not being alone either. And I think that that's very important. There's this cathartic thing that happens at some shows where you're like, you know what, I belong here. Right. I belong with people that I belong with, and I I love that, and I let we've always been about that, you know. And in the in the songwriting, it's the same thing, but but it is challenging because we are all songwriters in the band too. Mm. So nowadays, now I have a studio. Justin's got his studio. Ryan's in Round Rock. He's got his studio. Will's at his place. Jeremy's at his place. We all have recording set up. So now it's, hey, send me what you got. Right. Instead of, hey, let's get together let's and get jam, together. it's, let me hear your ideas. Let me see what you got, you know? So there's a constant, like, pressure and challenge of, like, mm-hmm. oh, I got to I gotta produce. Right. I got to have quality ideas, you know? So That's the good. fun part. Friendly competition, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So take me now. I mean, I mean, you've, you've had much success to where now you've kind of given your experience now and reaching back out to the next generation and kind yeah. of art, art of, artist development program. Yeah, yeah. Tell a little bit more about what you have going on with that? So I um, I know a lot of musicians and a lot of artists and songwriters that are very uh, they're very introverted and they're very good at what they do, but they're they're just not really people. They're not really into people. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're not the best. They're not much of a people person, I guess you could just say. Let me create. Leave yeah, me alone. Yeah, let me do my just thing me... and you handle yeah. all that. You know, here, handle my social media, whatever it is. Um, I, I uh, really like to teach. And I really like to mentor and I really like to work with younger kids and the next generation of artists. And I, I've mentored kind of without there being an infrastructure for a really long time where I've, I'm not, I'm never afraid to say, Hey, the session's over, but somebody's got questions for me. I enjoy hanging out after the session and mm-hmm. answering questions and talking about my experience and giving some pointers, you know, because my whole thing is I know some people that are like, Nope, it's 10 o'clock. I'm out. I got to go. Right. And I, and my thing is like, well, don't you want to see the artists that you just spent all that time with succeed? Right. I mean, don't you want something to happen with the song that you just busted your ass on? Like, it doesn't do you any good if nobody ever hears this, you know. So, so I like giving insight and sharing that. And I've been blessed because I've I've been on the board with Grounded Music, uh, which uh, Joe Stallone who's on, on the Black Fret board, um, one of the Black Fret mentors. He he founded that, and it's an amazing organization that helps with For sure. kids that that yeah. need studio experience that don't have Black access Fret. to it. Yeah, we just did an event with them. Yeah. Last week, yeah, they're still doing a lot of great things. So awesome, man. So and, and awesome. growing. Yeah, and growing for yeah. sure, you know. But And so, yeah, I've been a mentor with Black Fret, um, Grounded Music Black Fret, and, you know, been able to be uh, and work on the on the board at TRCOA as well. So work sure. with some young aspiring producers and engineers. And and that's been really uh, a big blessing to me. But one thing, you know, recently is I, I've become really good friends with a, a guy named Bernard Porter in Nashville, and he founded a company called PCG. And they work with a lot of younger artists, and so we're starting a division of that here in Austin. And so Austin, Austin's kind of a funny, funny place. It's a, uh, it's the music, the live music capital of the world, and I, I get that. But there's really not a lot of infrastructure here for artists. Right. There's not like it, it's funny because to me, being here in the studio, it blows my mind how many 
incredible young R&B singers I hear, mm-hmm. and you don't hear anything about them. Chronicles right. not talking about them. Like you, you just don't. They don't have any exposure. They have no infrastructure at all. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 funny almost, you know. So to me, I'm like, I'm so happy that we're able to do this and be able to work with a company like PCG because now there is infrastructure and now we have this alliance with these guys in Nashville who have connections mm-hmm. and we can work with these kids and we can actually not only create quality music and create great recordings, but we can help them with their career. Right. We can actually go, okay, hey, these are the lessons you learn along the way. Sure. This is what you need to do now. The record's done. What do you do now? Right. You know, and so I'm, I'm really Man, that's pumped a, that's a great uh, That's a great opportunity for, for artists coming up. I mean, you're, yeah. you're basically an on-ramp and connecting that bridge, yeah. you know, to their next level of their career. Exactly. Basically, yeah, you know, yeah. and... And it's a it's a great learning tool, you know. A lot of a lot of kids is they do have a lot of great music out mm-hmm. there, but that's the question: what's next? Right. What's yeah. next? Yeah, I've heard that you know? so many times. <laughs> <laughs> you what's know, next? it's and, and that's a legitimate question, you know. But uh, and, and not that there's a formula that works for everybody. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own circumstances. Yeah. You know, but so so let's just say, I mean, for the kid out there, like, hey, I want to be a part of this program. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, obviously. You want kids that are passionate, that have talent, you know, want to want to put yeah. in the work. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 pretty sure those are good qualifications, good character. Yeah. You know, but what would you say to that kid that's out there listening right now to this podcast? How would they get involved or prepare themselves? Yeah. To get involved in a phenomenal program like that. Well, so so PCG, uh, that's something you could check out online. Um, it's really easy. I mean, there's so much information online. You know, it's so easy nowadays to Google something and sure. find out a lot of what you need to know. And so there's definitely a lot of information out there. Um, there's actually an online. Uh, there's actually courses that you can do with PCG online as well, where if you you're not ready to make that kind of commitment, it's not something mm-hmm. that you're ready to jump into full time. You can do select courses, almost kind of a la carte. Like I want to try a co-writing session, okay. I want to try a vo- you know a voice lesson session, right. and work with this team and work with different members and try different things. But it's also one of those things where PCG is very select. It it is uh, there's a lot to it. There mm-hmm. are a lot of moving parts. It's not for everybody necessarily. Sure. So the other side of that to me is. Um, well, I, you know, I take that back. I think it is for everybody, actually. But, but you know, just like anything in life, some people may go, well, maybe that's not the best fit for me or whatever. So what I say is, these days, recording your music and getting that experience and working with a producer and going into a studio and taking your stuff and then going and working with other songwriters who want to mentor you, that is so valuable. And that's mm-hmm. something that now... You don't have to go through the record labels and the big gatekeepers anymore. Back in the day, there's this old school model of doing doing things where it was, you had your song, you had whatever, and you earned making a record, right? Mm-hmm. You went out and you, you you worked for a long time, and your band practiced those songs relentlessly till you were ready, and then somebody noticed you, and then a record label signed you, and then you were deemed worthy of these things. Mm-hmm. You were deemed worthy of working with professional songwriters and blah 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 blah. But something like PCG is great because it's it's it adapts to the new model of things, which is man, I see all these kids that are doing things themselves. They're distributing their own music. They're they're working with DistroKid or CD Baby or whatever, right. and they're putting music out there themselves. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're recording it on their laptop in their bedroom, and they're getting followers and they're getting people to buy into their message and buy into their songs. And then when you have somebody that's that that grinds that hard and cares that much about their craft. They can easily then take it to the next level, which is maybe to seek out somebody like Black Fret, you know, mm-hmm. where it's, hey, I'm an, you know, I'm an artist and you know, I, I have something to say and I have a unique and original message. Maybe I'm a good fit. Or a PCG, hey, I'm a singer-songwriter and I'd really sure. like some experience working with some professional songwriters. I'd like to get some insight from them. All of those tools are there now and they didn't, it didn't used to be that way. Right. You know, it was like you yeah. had to figure out a lot of it for yourself back in the day. It was rough back you know? in the day. It, it was hard. It was very hard. And not that it's not hard now because it is hard and it's more competitive. The than information it's ever was been. kind of felt like it was hard to obtain. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, it was, we don't have, we didn't have YouTube and, yeah. I mean, the internet. I mean, there's obviously, obviously tons of stuff, but I feel like people are now, we didn't have the camera phones to get a sneak peek right. of what it looked like inside of a, yeah, uh, a studio session, a writing session now inside of a. There was a lot of you know, mystery. It was a lot of mystery around recording and making albums yeah. and 
you know, I remember hearing stories about like Fleetwood Mac in the studio and it's like, wow, that's so cool. And now it's, hey, I'm in the studio, everybody. Right. <laughs> Here I am. Check it out. You finally get in yeah. the studio. It's like, dang, it's nothing. Not yeah. what I thought, man. Where's yeah. all the girls? <laughs> what? <and> What's up? <laughs> I got to work? <laughs> man, that's so, that, so that's awesome, man. So so let's tell me more, man. Let's just dive into like the mindset of mm. all this that you've been through. How do you now come back to being normal, having yeah. a family, having you know a wife and kids? Just yeah balancing being on the road mm. and fans like how how does that does that play a part or do y'all have a lot of conversations at oh, home yeah. to yeah. balance that or well you know i i i'm very fortunate that i married somebody who understood what i did when we got together it's not like we got together and then you know two years later i went i'm gonna join a band that would have right. been a what you know like what do you mean so uh, i i feel like you you really need to have a partner who's very independent you need to have a partner who is okay with it, uh, with not having constant contact and mm -hmm. being able to go, you know what, I'm going to hold the fort down for a month. Right. You go earn. You go do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. I got this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And there's a lot of balance and there's a lot of that that goes on. And not that there aren't struggles, because of course there are, and it can be hard, you know, and um, a lot of times you hear about relationships in the music business or in the entertainment business that, that fail for that reason. And 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 it's obvious why you know I mean there are a lot of different reasons but but it's obvious that it can be tough it can be it comes with a lot of challenges um, and then the insecurities of you're on the road and people are you know adore you and blah 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 right. all that you know which is a whole another set of things but but that's my, my relationship is is it's pretty straightforward you know it's yeah. it's it's always been very uh, trusting and very honest and from day one it's just been look you know this is what you do and this is what I do and that's great and right. and it works for that reason you know but um the the thing for me is uh is having a studio on top of that you know i i i i have to balance i wear a lot of hats and i have to balance right. those things and our understanding is very much like look this is this is what i'm passionate about this is what i love and this is what i do but i also have to make time mm -hmm. to be a father and mm -hmm. i have to make time i have to know when to shut off sometimes and that can be hard that can be hard to do when you yeah. Or a producer and you've got artists that are hey you know checking out on mixes or mm -hmm. you know whatever it is or you know hey let's you know can we schedule pre-production or whatever it is like but i think over time you start to learn like look i i, I can do this you know mm -hmm. i can focus on my family i can focus on my craft and there is a way to balance both of them sure and i definitely spread myself thin sometimes yeah for sure it's tough yeah but when you spread yourself thin doing the things that you love it doesn't feel it like doesn't it. feel like it yeah you know so yeah That's that's pretty cool. So let's just talk about the studio um, mm. that you have. You're the co-owner yeah. of uh, Orb Studios. Yeah. Um, I've been fortunate enough to do a couple projects here. Yeah, I've been here a few times. Incredible yeah. sound. I mean, yeah. I, I honestly, I mean, I'm not saying this just because I'm <clears> here, <throat> but I, I think this is probably the best studio, um, not just in Austin, but probably worldwide. I mean, just the sound that you get. Thank you, And man. the production, the yeah. team. Very friendly team here, very open doors, just really make you feel uh, welcome. And, and your resume speaks for it. I mean, y'all, you've had Justin Bieber record here, mm -hmm. Lil Wayne, SZA, yeah, uh, Pentatonix. Uh, I mean, gosh, I I don't even know. Yeah, who else? I mean, I can keep going we, down the we, line. We've had, if you look at our client list, this is the thing I'm probably the most proud of. Right, is that it's not like I see some studios that have like, you know a hundred great country artists mm -hmm. and then a bunch of other artists you never heard of, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it t it tells you that they kind of lean towards one genre. Right. And then in turn, I've seen other studios that it's like, whoa, I recognize a lot of hip hop clients. Yeah. I don't know any of these rock bands. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, there's a bunch of rock bands. I don't know any of these hip hop clients. Yeah. The thing that I love about what we do, I almost kind of call it, and I referenced them earlier, but we're kind of the fishbone of studios. We do everything. Yeah. And we blend it all together. And some days you'll come in here and there will be, you know, Pentatonix was in here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm with a rock band in the other room. And somebody right. came over and went, hey, you guys want to come do background vocals? And right. so we go from one studio over to the other. And it's like this two worlds colliding, you yeah. know. And, and if you look at our client list, it's really all over the place. It's all yes. over the map. And I love that. Yeah. I love that because I'm not a genre-specific producer. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't just do R&B or rock or country. 
or you know, I do everything. Singer, right. songwriter, Americana, I do I, I like to work on all of it and I and and I don't necessarily enjoy working on one genre more than another. I like to do everything, you know, and and so our 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 uh clientele is really all over the place. It's not specific to one genre. And a lot of times clients that are used to like when you start talking about clients like Avicii and Bieber and Charlie XCX, mm -hmm. like those are artists that have a very specific aesthetic right. and want a certain kind of environment. Right. And we, because we built this from the ground up, we did it in a certain way. I feel like we supply that environment, mm -hmm. and and it's not easy. It was to intentional, do. very intentional. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you were like okay, we're gonna have Skrillex in here today. Yeah, but I want it intentional that you know we'll go to Khalil. Yeah. The next day. Yeah. Travis Scott, the next. Exactly, man. So we, And then we'll do our Blue October when they leave. Yeah, right? There you go. There you go, man. And that's the idea. It's hard to, it's hard to satisfy yeah. everybody, you know, but that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to go from, you know, like you said, Skrillex to, you know, yeah. a dirty punk rock band the next day. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, and, and, and nobody misses a beat. And the thing that I hear over and over again when people come here is, man, I'm comfortable here. I feel Very at home here. Yeah. And, and there's no ego there's no attitude i have been in the studio as an artist so many times where i'm like i can't believe we're paying people to be treated this way mm. why am i giving this person my money to right. just tell me how much i suck or how cool i'm not you know like i don't need that i don't need like the indie hipster guy like just talking down to me the whole time i'm there and there's a lot of that in the music business man there's a lot of jaded jaded yeah. people in the music business that all they want to do is talk about how horrible everything is feed their and, ego and feed their ego yeah. and and just negative negative blah 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 or you know people that on the other on the other side of things are don't really understand the experience that's necessary or understand that like you earn your place mm -hmm. and then they just kind of make assumptions like oh well you know i read somewhere that i should get half the publishing if i make a beat for somebody so like those things are just ridiculous to yeah. me man you know it's like look er everybody earns their place right and everybody puts in the work and they get mm -hmm. to where they need to be and that's what i love about this place and the people that we have here is and we've had a lot of great talented people come and go too and I love seeing like some of the people that used to be here and used to work here that are now doing their own thing. Sure. You know, we've got like um, all kinds of people that have worked here and produced and engineered here that are we're still friends with and we still talk to. And like some are in L.A. and some are still here in Austin, but they have their yeah. own studios now. And I love that, man. Right. I love that. We got a big family. It's great. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a almost a almost a grooming ground. You could sure. almost say. I yeah. Mean, yeah. An incubator. An incubator. Yeah. There you go. I love that word. <laughs> there you go yeah. so tell me a little bit more about i guess is there anything now that you uh i mean you you, you talked a lot about the mentoring mm. but is there anything that you specifically are working on now or looking to do in the future yeah you know i th i think one um i think and i guess this kind of falls into the the umbrella of mentoring and in talking to kids and sharing, you know, a valuable message with them. But I'm really trying to get away from the thought process of what's hip and happening right now and how do we fit into that. And I'm trying to get ahead of the curve. Elaborate on that a little bit. So I've heard said, if you want to write a hit song and you're listening to the radio and you're trying to write a hit song based on what you're listening to, you're already too late. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing can go for a studio, and the same thing can go for being a songwriter and working with other people, right? So to me, I want to stay ahead of the game. I want to find artists and, and cultivate and work with artists that more than anything mm -hmm. are unique yeah. and original and have something interesting and fresh and have a whole new perspective. And so I'm like looking specifically for artists that might even be really weird or left to center, mm -hmm. but there's something cool about it. And there's something yeah. like, I want to hear that again. I don't know why, but I want to hear that again. Or I want to see that again. I want to know what, what this is all about. And I feel like there are a lot of uh, producers in studios and teams that are like, hey, this is what's hot right now. Let's just try to cash in on that. Yeah. Let's try to do, you know, the dance hall beat thing. Like, because, every, you know, like... I'm not, I don't care about that. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about like dating ourselves. You know, like mm -hmm. to me, I love the idea that, like, hey, if you're going to get into this and you're going to do this, what is it about you 
Yeah. Now, what is it about you as an individual and, and as an artist? What's your message? What is it you're trying to say? And what makes you stand out? Mm -hmm. 60 to 80, th I heard that 60 to 80,000 songs a day are released Jeez. worldwide. And, yes. and obviously not all professional. I mean, you, you know. But you got to weed through all the noise. A day. Like, you come know. on, you know. So, what do you, I mean, what do you tell? I mean, because it, it can get very, you're talking from wisdom. You've mm -hmm. been in the game for decades, and mm -hmm. I understand you. Uh, but for the kid that started out, I mean, that can be kind of confusing. I mean, I was that guy. I was confused. I was like, one moment, hey, study the billboards. And yeah. then the next moment is, hey, be original, be unique. And, you know, so how do you, what do you tell that kid that's kind of stuck in the middle of those two? Because you do need the billboards to learn frequencies. And I think just a yeah. little bit to kind of see, okay, this is who their investors and the sure. people that can gatekeepers. So well, to speak. And you know who, you know who you're, 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 uh, your peers are yes. more than anything you know who, what's the world you're living in mm -hmm. who are those other artists and so to me it's not about it necessarily being competition it's i think that it's good to be to stay on top of like i said earlier stay with the band aware. we listen to relevant artists but yeah. we listen to, the, to them for a reason because we don't ever want to get stuck in our own habits yeah and when you listen to new stuff and you listen to fresh songs and fresh material and you hear a new artist like i hear a lot of people that are very pro billy eilish and a lot of people that are just like ah, i'm over it i hear about it all the time but here's the thing about billy eilish mm -hmm. that you cannot deny there are a million copycat artists out there right now trying to do what she does because she did something different right she did something new she did something unique and that right there says everything to mm -hmm. me and so if you're listening to that i'm not saying that you have to go and okay well I'm going to go tailor my song to that because that's what Taylor Swift does or sure. that's what Billie Eilish does. But I'm going to listen to that specifically so that I don't grow old and complacent in my own habits. Right. And I can go, whoa, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Or, whoa, I didn't know that you could, you know, have that kind of reverb on a 50 sounding guitar with that kind of modern drum program sound and it could sound that cool. I mean, to me, it's just about challenging yourself. But but the most important thing is being original. Yeah. The most important thing is sticking to your to your guns and 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 yes, you do, you can't have a twelve minute song on the radio. <laughs> right. But you can still be yourself in four minutes. Right. You know, and I think I think that's more important than anything. I yeah. really do. That's a good tip. How to balance the two. You know. Yeah. We do want to know what a chorus is in your song, possibly. You know, right. maybe a verse. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool when you, you meet somebody that's just super talented, but they have no format. Yeah. You just say, like, all right, give me something to sing or write or rap. Or, and they just like. Yeah. Just, I know a lot of those people. <laughs> well, all right. We're going to chop this up and arrange this in a, in a song format. Anyway, yeah. And it seems like that's something in the process you, you enjoy. I you, do. You, you yeah. tackle those moments and really enjoy i do enjoy I, that process i i've always like i'm not a I, i'm i'm not a great songwriter and i've never been a great songwriter um i beg to differ but <laughs> um well i enjoy it i really do and i've got i've been really fortunate to work with some great songwriters and work with a lot of other writers and and have a pretty diverse catalog and but the thing that i feel like i really bring to the table and i feel like my strength is identifying what's working and what's not and it's not that I'm necessarily going to come up with the best chorus, but I can hear something in a chorus. Mm -hmm. And I can hear something in a verse, and I can hear something that's happening and go, wait, 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 maybe that should be here, or maybe that should be like this. And I feel like that's my talent, and that's my gift. And I've always been, in the bands that I've been in, in Blue October included, yeah, I write, and I, you know, I, I co-write probably on average two or three songs a record. Mm -hmm. But that's not really been my 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 main role my main role has always kind of been like the arranger yeah you know has always been like well wait a minute maybe that verse sucks <laughs> or maybe that outro is too long or maybe like resolving is just kind of not the right idea there you know like i've always kind of been that guy and had that voice um and you know my uh, honestly one of my favorite uh one of my heroes is adam blackstone and adam blackstone is like because that guy does all of that He's an right. arranger, he's a music director, he's a songwriter, he's a producer, he's a bass yeah. player. He does all those things and he does them all so well. And he's made an amazing career out of being able to balance all of those things. Right. You know? Yeah, for sure, man. Man, it's definitely an inspiration. You know, someone like myself, pride myself on trying to be versatile. Versa yeah. Versatility as a music producer, I think it's almost a, 
it's not, it depends if you're doing a certain thing. Maybe you don't have to be as versatile. But mm -hmm. to me, when I go in the studio, or it, it just bothers me when I see the same person just playing the same old, yeah. same old. You know, yeah. it, it kind of rubs me a little bit away. You know, there's studios that do that too. I mean, some mm -hmm. studios that have had success, but they're very complacent. You know, and it's like you, you know, I always kind of joke around that like I've been in one studio in particular and in Nashville, Tennessee, and I went I went in there, and about eight years later, I went back to that same studio, and I was like, I think that hi-hat mic is in the exact same spot it was yeah. eight years ago when I was here last time. That's complacency, man. That's just kind of... Mm. You got to be a little curious in the studio. Yeah. Like I said, you said, throw, throw a reverb on something that doesn't belong with a reverb, and just For see sure. what you get. For sure. Just try it out. And you know, you know when, you, when you do this full-time like we do, and when you're in the studio and you're creating all the time... It's inevitable that you, at some point, you will fall into habits, and I've done it. I've I've mm -hmm. definitely done it. But the thing that I pride I I or not pride myself on, but I'm very I guess I'm very blessed to to be uh, that I've I've experienced is that I've worked with other people that keep me in check. Right. And so I've had other engineers. We had we had a guy that worked here for a long time, and he was a younger guy. He's an amazing engineer, and he called me out, man. And I was like, wow, that kind of takes balls. Like that guy's he's calling me out right now. But he was right. He was mm -hmm. like, man. You kind of fall into your habits a little bit, you know. And yeah. we worked on this on this band called Blue Apollo, and he was like, "I actually, I think that's my favorite thing I've done with you yet." And I was like, "Really?" And he was like, "Yeah, because you tried some new stuff." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh man, I gotta <laughs> he's keeping on my toes. Like I gotta try harder." He's right, you know. So um, that's a good team around you. It is, man. It is, yeah. and we've been really blessed to have, and we still do. I mean, we've got you know a couple engineers here now that are always keeping me in check, man. And we all keep each other in check. I heard some uh, another producer say a while ago, it said that, um, you know, once you get to a certain point, nothing's bad. There's no such thing as a bad idea. So basically, if you know, if yeah. you're writing a couple of songs and they're not coming out good, you know, a good producer, now he's at the point, you know what? I used to just be like, we'll just scrap it, just throw it away. Yeah. Now he's like, you know what? Give me those sessions. Yeah. Let me, let me, I'll make something out of that, man. Let, I'll take a, I'll take this keyboard and turn it into a clavinet, and yeah. I'll switch the. You know, you'll just find the puzzle pieces to make it work. That's half of being a producer, right there. Yeah. You know, I mean, half of being a producer in this day and age is just seeing through the weeds. Yeah, and I say that all the time. I'm like, no, no, no. I can see through the weeds. Like, you know, I work with artists, and like I said, I work with a lot of young artists, and, and I was, I was actually had a meeting with one today, and um, and I said, send me every demo that you have. And she was like, you mean like my five favorite? And I said, no, all of them. Well, why do you want all my demos? Because I'm going to hear something that you don't. Right. You know, and I'm going to hear something that you probably think sucks, mm -hmm. but there might be something in there. Right. You know, and that's that's what being a producer, that's half the fun, right? Yeah. You know? Man, I think if you guys didn't get anything else from that, this whole entire podcast, I, I think that's that's the secret right there. Yeah. Finding a spot. Yeah. finding something and knowing that it's going to work yeah absolutely you know, for yeah. sure well man hey thank you so much for joining the keys method i think this has been a a, a very eye-opening conversation i mean is it is it anything else or where can people find you at uh online oh, or man, social media I, yeah, yeah, i sit here stuff? talking about like you know being smart about your business and promoting yourself <laughs> and i'm horrible at it um I, you know, I really, the only, the only, um, well, first of all, orbstudios.com. There you go. Um, www.orbstudios, or recordingstudios.com, pardon me. Uh, that's our website. And uh, it, there's, you know, our gear list and our client list and, you know, pictures. And, but if you're, if you're in the area and you want to come check out the studio, we do tours. And okay. we highly encourage people to do tours because just like anything in life, you know, it's one thing to take an online course and it's one thing to sit there in person with somebody and learn yeah. from them. And so it's the same thing with the studio. I encourage you to come see it and yeah. get a tour. Um, but for me personally, my Instagram is, is really kind of my uh, – that's the one thing I got. You know, I, I gave yeah. up on Facebook. I gave up on Twitter. So I'm uh, uh, just Matt Noveski. That's it. Very simple. There you go. And and just real quickly, because I know a lot of people hit me up when I talk to guys. They want to know, like, what's your gear list on tour? Uh, and I know maybe, like, guys right now, I apologize. I don't know how busy you are with this whole COVID thing, but uh, oh, if man. some stuff got canceled or whatnot. But our, when, our, yeah, a lot of stuff got <laughs> yeah, canceled. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. We were actually on the first date of our spring tour when it all got shut down. 
the first date? The first date of the whole tour, it got <sighs> shut down. So we came home and we postponed it. Then that got shut down. Then the next leg got shut down. So we're just in this like wait and see game right now yeah. where it's like, are we going to tour? Or are we going to do the fall tour? Are we going to, we yeah. just don't know. You know, it's just full of uncertainty. And you can't even, that's, yeah. that's internationally or oh, and it's yeah. everywhere. It's, it's just, you can't it, go anywhere. It's everywhere. And I mean, people are trying stuff and people are trying like quarter capacity, half capacity, little people pods or whatever it is and they're doing like drive-in yeah. shows and hmm. it's not very practical for a band like us because there's a lot of overhead for us it's expensive to tour so we have yeah. to do it right sure so i don't know when we're going to be back out there again we will be back out there but mm -hmm. we are doing a live a full band live stream july 25th and we have our own platform it's called getbackup.tv nice and there's a lot of good info on there there's a lot of cool stuff on Say there that like get videos back up. and tons of blue october info on there yeah. Get back up TV. Yeah. July twenty fifth. We'll be doing Definitely a live stream. Definitely gonna check that out. Yeah. So so I know you're you're uh, I think you're sponsored with uh, Aguilar endorsed yeah. with Aguilar. Yeah. I mean that's I'm a nerd about this stuff. Shout man. out to Aguilar. I mean, yeah. let's get into the gear just really, really quickly. So, so take me down your gear list. I uh I'm I'm a, I'm a man of many bases. <laughs> I love uh gear. I'm such a nerd about it. Like I obsess over it. I'm constantly on reverb looking at new stuff and trying to find a new piece or a new pedal or whatever it is but but i do have some brands that i, I i'm associated with that i love and i'm i'm a big fan of first of all chc guitars right here in austin chris cordova that's my boy i love him he makes great guitars great basses Shout out to I've chris. Got, i got three three chc basses and i love all of them um i i'm doing my own project right now it's mostly my own music and i'm playing uh, i made me a bass and i'm using that bass on pretty much all of it nice uh and then uh, Sandberg is a German company. I play their basses, and I'm very tight with them. I love their stuff. I have an F bass, which is like, you know, doing a session like, you know, uh, somebody like Ty or Alicia Lani or something like that. Like, that bass is so smooth, man. That's my that's my R&B bass. That's your go-to R&B bass, huh? Yeah, yeah, it is. What do, uh, what do you play on the road? So on Which the road, one? I play a good blend. I play, I have an old a Fender Tony Franklin I've had for a long time. I play Sandberg. You know, I've been playing the same jazz, Sandberg jazz bass for a long time. Um, and then it just kind of depends on what tour it is. You know, I'll swap it out. I brought the F bass out on the last tour. Um, CHC for sure. But I actually bring four or five basses with me every tour, and I, I swap them out. Ooh. I, I change basses a lot depending on what song it is. I'm, I'm pretty serious about you it. You are know? serious about your gear. Yeah. Lots That's... of pedals. For a, for a bass player, I have a huge pedal board, actually, and I use a lot of effects. Um, I've seen your pedal board. Yeah, well, I think I think I've seen. I don't. I don't know, man. I think I've seen some of your pedals. Board. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of obsessed with it, man. And um, but you know, to me, like again, like thinking about like some of my favorite bass players, like Ethan Farmer and and uh, you know, again, uh, Adam Blackstone. Like th you know, like mm -hmm. I, those guys are very good at playing synth bass and right. electric bass. And I don't get to play synth bass, so I like to kind of do my own version of synth bass on stage. So I use a lot of fuzzes and mm. octaves and create some unique sounds with my bass. So I do a lot of that with my gear. And um, and then and, and amp-wise, amp and cabs, Aguilar all the way, man. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I've been with them for a long time. They've been very supportive of me yeah. in my career, and uh, I'll never play anything else. Dude, you turned me on to Aguilar. I yeah. think we was working on Ty Austin's pro, uh, project together, yeah. and I was like, what is that? deep like oh, that sound and i looked over there and i was yeah. like aguilar i was like now i see somebody another, i don't even play bass but yeah. i see another bass player i'd be like bro might want to get you some aguilar yeah. gear, over, <laughs> gear over there or if somebody do that i'll shake great, their hand man. and be like oh i know what kind of sound we're getting tonight man it's, it's it's not only is it great sound and stuff and i mean it, it's top notch it really is it's my it's my favorite gear in the world but they actually um you know i'm gonna be 44 right and Heavy gear is not my friend. Like if right. it's a if I'm playing a local show or a gig, you know, like a fill-in gig or something like that, I have to. I don't have a, a tech. You know, I'm going mm. old school. I'm lifting it myself. So I actually gave myself a hernia lifting a bass cab oh, once. Okay. Never ever will I do that again. Aguilar is the only company I know that makes lightweight gear that sounds amazing. I have a 700 watt amp head that's like five pounds. Wow, that's crazy. You know, and it sounds amazing. You know, so again, I'm not being paid to say this. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. I no, love their stuff. I'm not being paid to say it either, but go get you some Aguilar gear, bass players. There you go. Aguilar everything. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, man, for, for the time, Matt, for just sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and, and also opening up Orb Studios, just a phenomenal uh, recording studio. If you ever do come out, Austin, I'm telling you guys, this is by far 
a phenomenal place to record your next project. Uh, take advantage of the information that you got here. Uh, if you're an up and coming artist looking for development, go out and look at some of these programs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a lot of great resources that you know these guys are out here. They want to help you. They want to take you to the next level and give you you know the tools necessary for you to have a successful career just like he has. I mean, two decades, four, I mean, 30 probably plus years yeah. um, involved in music, and now you're reaching back, helping others. So once again, thank you, Matt. Thank you, and man. Yeah, This awesome. has been another episode of The Keys Method. I am Chris Keys. Peace. <laughs>